Hi, I'm Mike Samuel. I work on Google's security engineering team, where we try to improve programming languages, libraries, frameworks, and other parts of our software development tool chain to make it easier to produce uh, secure and robust software. So, um, uh, uh, practice of programming has some of the best advice on how to avoid uh, bugs in your software. So every bug you can find can teach you how to prevent a similar bug from happening again or to recognize it if it does. And um, my colleagues and I put together a roadmap for Node.js security. So we wanted to understand what are the kinds of bugs that have security consequences in Node uh, uh, systems produced with Node.js. I'm not going to walk you through it. What I'd like to do instead is to uh, show you a little bit about how security engineers go about uh, our work, how we identify uh, classes of vulnerabilities and then try to address them. And so what I'd like to impress upon you is that given the right tools, we can address en entire classes of vulnerabilities. So instead of just finding a particular instance of a bug, we want to uh, deal with all instances of a bug in a, uh, a product. So I'm going to show you some mediocre code. This is code that I've written. Um, and I'm going to walk uh, through it and uh, uh, show you some bugs in it. Um, then I want to uh, show you how we can comprehensively address uh, the, the, uh, the root causes of those issues. Then I'll get into some of the human factors and how uh, web standards can, uh, can uh, help us advance security. So let me show you some uh, code. So can you, is, this, uh, is this something that people can see? If, if this is uh, too small, you might want to move forward. Uh, so as you can see, this is a v uh, vanilla Node.js server. I am requiring a bunch of modules up, up top. The least popular of these modules has about 350,000 downloads uh, per week. So these are not uh, uncommon modules to see. Um, I'm, I'm setting some headers. Um, and uh, well, the Chrome people would be unhappy with me if I showed uh, uh, Chrome XSS protection uh, uh, bypasses. So I'm uh, putting in XSS protection zero for demo purposes. Um, and then I've got a function that creates a handler. So it uh, does some session management, make sure that there's a unique per client cookie. And then we get into the bulk of the handler function. So you can see here uh, in the middle, it's, uh, I've defined the URL space. So we've got slash, which is our index page, um, upload, which uh, lets me upload a file, uh, calculate, which calculates an expression, and then we collect client errors. So let me show you how this works in practice. So uh, the goal of this application is to let people upload equations and then compute them with results. And so I can choose XPY, just has the text X plus Y in it. I upload that file. It tells me, gives me something that I can share with other users. Um, and I can type some JSON into the box here. You see that I've got a radio button. And if I can type a line of JSON without screwing up, um, I get 1 plus 1 is 42. This isn't particularly surprising, but I do have to wonder what it all means. Um, so uh, we've got our URL space, and then uh, we get into the handlers. Um, so you can see when we're serving the index page, we spit out a bunch of HTML. Um, and uh, we've spit out a form with our text area and a radio button for each of our uploaded files. Um, at the, and at the bottom, we have our upload form. So once we've got uh, our equation, once, uh, once a user tries to upload forms, I use multi-party to handle the upload. Um, for each file, I, uh, uh, multi-party gives us a uh, random file name for each file. It gives us a temporary file. Um, and we're calling out to the shell. So we CD to a directory. We create a directory for the current session, if one, one doesn't exist. 
we move the temporary file um, into a shared path, which uh, uh, gives us, um, uh, which just has the same uh, base name as the temporary file. That's an auto-generated file name. Um, and then we link the shared file into the uh, current uses directory. So you're probably thinking, he's calling out to the shell. This is a big security no-no. This kind of thing happens in a lot of code because the shell is so seductively simple. Um, this is a very succinct piece of code that does something that would probably require a dozen lines. In addition, all of the inputs, fs root is controlled by the application. This directory is based on random numbers uh, generated by the application. They're not controlled by an attacker. The same for the rest of it. The attacker controls none of, this, uh, none of the inputs to this, except as it turns out the file extension of the uploaded file. So this seems like a very incontroversial use of something that's known to be a hazard. And as it turns out, um, there is a subtle bug in, excuse me. Uh, so I can send a crafted input, if I don't fall off the stage, I can send a crafted input to uh, the upload form, and it has this uh, file name. Um, And that works. You can see that it's generating the crafted upload here based on uh, this file extension. The file extension is x.y, followed by an obscure Unicode new line, followed by something which breaks out of quoted string. Then it does touch pwned. And then it continues on with something. It reopens a quote so that, uh, so that the whole uh, forms a valid shell string. And if I look for the file pwned, it's now sitting in the root directory of my application. So what happened was uh, we, uh, a, a very uh, quite uncontroversial use of um, uh, the shell uh, due to an obscure bug in a uh, in a uh, third-party library, uh, one that has been fixed, by the way, so I'm not like reporting zero days here. Um, uh, uh, an obscure bug in a third-party library uh, lets me um, uh, take over the shell, get uh, shell special characters into uh, where the user thought that there were only going to be alphanumerics uh, from a randomly generated file name. And so, we need to have more consistent ways to address this problem. Um, and that's going to be a theme throughout this talk. So moving on, when we calculate the result, we read the uploaded file, for example, the xpy.expression, which contains the text x plus 1. Um, we parse some JSON. In, uh, when I showed you earlier, I showed you JSON, which said x was 1 and y was 41. Um, and then we get, uh, we use a library that uh, checks that the uploaded file only contains arithmetic operations. And then we, you know, the result of that is probably going to be a number. So we output a string if everything is OK. So if there's no error message, if there's an error message, we tell you there's an error message. We, we're, sure, we're careful to escape it. If not, we don't. Uh, there's a problem. Um, uh, arithmetic expressions in JavaScript sometimes uh, produce strings. And so, uh, that allows me to uh, run arbitrary JavaScript. I, if you didn't catch that, there was an alert which popped up. Um, so I, the, the payload is script alert one script. I ran that on the client. So again, um, 
the, this is the kind of error you know, uh, that occurs in a lot of, uh, for example, ad hoc uh, reporting software where you need to evaluate client-side expressions. Um, and it's an easy mistake to make. We need a consistent way, you know, the, the developer has, has inserted escape HTML directives all over the place. They missed one spot that left them vulnerable. We need to, uh, better ways to avoid our security depending on catching all of a particular kind of error. And finally, uh, uh, you know, we've got logs on the server side that help us diagnose problems on the server. We also often want to figure out what's going on on the client. So log client error is a receiver for, um, for messages from the client. On the client, I don't know if you can see this, uh, we monkey patch console.error so that it not only dumps things to the developer console, it also phones home with error messages. Um, and there's this intriguing little style equals zebra. So I don't know if uh, you guys are familiar with uh, the colors module. Let me just show you what this looks like in practice. So um, let's try not to fall off this side either. So I uh, did console.error, zebras are so fun. You see it shows up in the developer console. And you can see down here, zebras are so fun. Um, and that happens because, uh, and the colors module allows you to colorize your log output. This is the kind of thing that, you know, an intern comes into your project, they decide, <laughs> uh, I'm having trouble trawling through logs to find uh, what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make their logs a little bit more awesome. Um, you know, zebras are so fun, you know, rainbows are awesome, and they're even more awesome when they're in your log files. So, uh, A attacker can obviously spam your logs now, but uh, unless if you're going to accept telemetry from the client at all, especially when the client isn't in a consistent state, you need to uh, you know accept that and, and, and filter it later. So, but there's another thing that uh, that an attacker can do with this um, uh, because of a uh, another subtle flaw that has since been fi fixed in the color package, um, I can upload a file. So I'm going to upload hello world.js and it gives me this random string. So I'm going to say nonce equals that random string. Um, rather than trying to type out an entire attack. So this uh, attack code, you can see over here, it does a post to client error, but with a style that is equal to dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot slash uploads slash nonce. So, the, there is a subtle flaw in um, colors.js. Colors, uh, if the type of the theme is string, then it requires the theme, which allows you to get an arbitrary string, um, uh, possibly attacker controlled, treated as a module name. So you can see down here that uh, the attacker code ran, hello world, and then we got the generic message that the attacker sent. So, so we saw uh, three different exploits. We saw exploits in, you know, this is uh, contrived code that I've put together. 
I wanted to put together, it's about 140 lines of code that is vulnerable to three different kinds of, uh, three different classes of vulnerabilities. Uh, it is the kind of code that you might say there's something dodgy going on in code review, but hopefully, if I've done my job, you can't quite put your finger on why, and yet it leaves this application wide open. Uh, what we didn't see was malicious code. None of, the, none of this code was written with the, uh, no malicious code reached this until it was actually running in production. Um, uh, we saw that the developer tried to resist attacks. So they put escape HTML in almost all the right places, but not consistently. We saw them use uh, widely used dependencies. We didn't see any uncommon dependencies that have probably not had enough eyeballs on them to catch uh, glaring errors. And we saw that our server-side JS was still vulnerable. Um, and ESLint and NPM audit, NPM audit is awesome, by the way, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't come across it yet. ESLint and NPM audit uh, report no problems with this code. So what we need is we need a way, these are the, kind, the common kind of errors that developers make. What we need is a way to make sure that even when developers make common errors, that we're not vulnerable. So I'm going to show you how to uh, fix these in what I hope you agree are comprehensive ways. Uh, I'm going to address the three problem problems. The abuse of require by the, via the, the, uh, uh, our client logs collection, um, shell injection when uh, on a file upload, and cross-site scripting. So uh, to fix XSS, the first thing we do, it's kind of ironic, we get rid of our dependency on escape HTML. Um, and we actually get rid of most of our code that generates HTML and move it into templates. So here we're requiring generated files uh, that are compiled from templates. Um, so all of this goes away, and we end up calling uh, response.end with a call to uh, a template. That template is compiled from a pug file. If you're not familiar with pug, it's a template language. It auto escapes uh, content. So in, in uh, the case of, let me see, I am having a hard time reading this. Um, so, <laughs> um, so here is a dynamic expression. The name of a radio button it includes a uh, radio and a number. Um, that will be auto -escaped, automatically escaped. Um, in this case, the session nonce will also be automatically HTML escaped. So this HTML escaping isn't, isn't perfect. Uh, it pug templates tend to still be vulnerable to JavaScript colon URLs reaching the wrong places. I'm working on a plugin to fix that. Um, and so we've moved our HTML generation, generating code to something that is safe by default. Uh, users can still opt out of escaping, but security weenies like me can design scanners that will find those kinds of problems. What we then do is we take our templates and we wrap them in a function so that they uh, the result is a value of type trusted HTML. Mint trusted HTML creates a trusted HTML value from a string. And so what we're doing here is we're using the type system. Instead of just passing strings around, we want to distinguish strings that we know are safe uh, from strings that we uh, do not know, we don't know where they come from. Um, then we monkey patch response.write and response.end. And what this means is that if, a, if any plain old string reaches response.end and response.write, it won't get written. Um, uh, you'll get an exception instead. This kind of guides developers towards using tools that produce trusted HTML. Um, and so we've covered the two endpoints. We've got our sources for creating trusted HTML, and we've got our endpoint that only accepts trusted HTML. Uh, this is uh, not perfect. Uh, a malicious developer could probably work around this by reaching into prototypes to get at the underlying response.write, uh, but it's pretty good when you, when you trust your developers and work with them. Um, and then what we need to do is we want to make sure we, we still have the problem. Who can create trusted HTML? Well, it turns out anybody. 
which means that the path for least resistance for a developer might be just, oh, I trust myself to make HTML, so I'll make trusted HTML. Uh, what, there's some machinery in this, uh, a mintable type. Mintable type is the super type of uh, trusted HTML. So there's uh, some machinery in there which lets us control who can create those values. So this appears in package.json. It says uh, we're granting the ability to create trusted HTML to the following packages, uh, trusted template.js. That's the file that we use to wrap our pug templates. And so there's one more wrinkle before we can really close the loop on this, but I'll, I'll point that out later. Uh, and then as an additional security measure, we put in a pretty strict content security policy. So if you guys are unfamiliar with the content security policy header, it allows you to specify what scripts can load. So the browser receives the content security policy header and then says, for this document, I will only allow, uh, in this case, scripts that have the source uh, CSP nonce, uh, uh, a nonce that is this CSP nonce value. Uh, that value is defined up there as a random uh, string that is uh, scoped to the session. So every, sorry, scoped to the, to the response. So every response has a different CSP nonce. Um, and so that means that only uh, script tags that are marked that way will run. Um, and then if there are any violations, they get reported and it show up in our logs. And in our uh, pug template, we mark our script tag with the CSP nonce so that uh, our form validation code runs. Um, and so we crafted a solution from safe by default tools, pug auto escapes unless you opt out, and we can control those opt outs. Uh, it uh, distinguishes safe from unsafe values for a particular context. In this case, the HTML that is allowed to be part of a response body. Um, we checked the safety at runtime. So we guarded our response writer so that response.write doesn't take arbitrary strings, only trusted HTML. And we, our grants of privilege, the ability to make trusted HTML values are stored in source control, and uh, they're checked at runtime. So, uh, Static linters like ESLint and TSLint, they can catch lots of errors, but they are unsound. By doing enforcement at runtime, we get around that problem. So on to the next vulnerability. Uh, you guys already saw this code. Um, we were granting trusted HTML, the, the ability to mint trusted HTML to trusted template. We also granted the ability to create uh, to SH template tag the ability to create something called SH fragment. And that's going to figure in our uh, solution to shell, shell injection. Um, it looks like I am running out of time, so maybe I should move forward. OK. So um, so what we end up doing is we end up replacing our callout to child process with a use of the sh template tag. And sh template tag is like pug, it auto escapes. It just auto escapes for the sh and bash grammars. Um, we use similar mechanisms um, uh, 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 to make sure that uh, only sh fragments can reach child process. And that involves hooking into require so that um, for example, the only thing that can require child process is the exec sh fragment. If anything else tries to, uh, we block it. And then quickly, um, we can also use these require hooks to do things like figure out what are all the production sources. Um, so I instrumented a Mocha test runner. The, uh, af after the tests run, I walked the module graph starting at the main module. Here's the main module, the gray modules. Uh, sorry if this is entirely unreadable. The 
gray modules are all things under node modules, and the white modules are uh, the actual source code. What we ended up with is we found that 58 JavaScript files were needed out of the 114 that were installed when uh, dash dash only equals prod, or out of the 6,804 that are available under node modules. Um, we can hash those, and we can make sure that uh, we block any requires of uh, files that have unrecognized hashes. So this solves our problem with the colors module. And so uh, crafting strong security stories, um, uh, having secure by design tools are useful, uh, is great, but they're only useful if people use them. Um, uh, we can run our test code to establish a baseline before code becomes available to open to attack. Um, uh, we can use lightweight dynamic enforcement, which actually solves the security problems, and if done right, it guides developers towards uh, these safe by design tools. And module linking hooks let us close a loop and make guarantees about only these modules could result in these kinds of security vulnerabilities. Therefore, we can, uh, security people like me can focus our attention on those particular modules. So uh, security is a team effort. Um, uh, with these techniques, a team can opt into uh, security pro processes. They can re record human judgments and source control about which modules they trust to do what. And they can enforce those judgments dynamically. And uh, I have lots of awesome uh, process diagrams, but uh, if you guys are interested in standards, here are four standards to keep an eye on that I, I think will help us with security. The Realm standard uh, gives uh, privilege separation within a uh, node namespace and provides the kinds of import hooks that I think are very useful. Trusted types uh, provides libraries for strings that are not just strings, strings that we trust to specify HTML or script or URLs that we might load into an origin. Um, uh, module keys allows us to represent the identity of a module in a way that's not spoof spoofable. And uh, decorators are not directly security relevant, but they provide things like annotations in other languages, which can improve the ergonomics of a lot of this. And you can get the node, sec, uh, the node security roadmap at that URL at the top. Uh, the code for, that I demoed is at that GitHub URL. Uh, here are some of the uh, some of the standards that I talked about. And if you like uh, web security, uh, I put together a series of web security puzzlers at tinyurl.com slash secpuzz. And you can find me at, on Twitter at MV Samuel. So thanks for being an awesome audience. <laughs>